Welcome to Public Affairs Roundtable, a discussion of current events in the nation and around the world and how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Long. It was but a single death, yet the means of death made it uh, significant, made it news throughout the country. A group of young white men attacked a group of blacks on a street corner in the Howard Beach area of New York City late in December. It led directly to the death of one of the black men who was chased into traffic, was hit and killed by an automobile. Why in a civilized society does this sort of thing happen when we're almost in the 21st century? We'll talk about race relations in this country and in Indiana today on Public Affairs Roundtable. Our guests are Irving Smith, who is president of the Muncie chapter of the NAACP, Sam Jones, who is president of the Indianapolis Urban League, and John Rouse, producer of Public Affairs Roundtable and a professor of political science here at Ball State. John, as I mentioned, in a civilized society, we're almost in the 21st century. Why do we still deal with things like this? Why is this sort of thing still happening? Well, our country is a very racial society. 13% of our population is black. The position of blacks in America is very different from other ethnic groups. The, 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 heritage, the heritage is different in the sense that blacks came to America as slaves, and so the, the, there's that difference. If the person at, uh, in Queens, New York, if the person had been of lower class white group, there would not have been a mention of this particular thing. And so Americans have a great deal of difficulty distinguishing between race and economic class. And so uh, we are a society of race, and oftentimes this issue is submerged in the ways that we deal with each other in society. So, so I think because of economics and, and also because of the uh, demographic composition of America, this is why this particular issue is important and will be important for the for foreseeable future. Irving Smith, was, was this death, was this attack that significant? I mean, like I said, it made national headlines. It made all the networks. Is yes. this symptomatic of a problem we have? This, is a, this problem is something that's an outgrowth of a change in attitudes in our society in this country. Uh, people have now become to the point to believe that it's fashionable to show racism, discrimination, those type of things now where here in the 80s, uh, you know, we've moved back to an era where, uh, much like the 60s, in which we had a lot of racial tensions and violence. We're starting to see that violence again because of some of the things that he just alluded to and that when the economy gets to the point where people do not have the jobs, and especially with our economy today where everybody's in direct competition with one another, blacks now have gotten themselves to the point where they're educating themselves twice as fast as they did in the 60s. Now, if you look at some statistics, uh, uh, between the age group of 18 and 34, uh, blacks have doubled the number of pe uh, their number of their participants who are graduating from college with degrees. At the same time, this, if you look at it in the same uh, at, for whites, the whites have also kept pace. But with more people now having degrees in their hand, it's become a, a market where the employer has, uh, you know, he can look and choose the best he wants. And what's happened to our society now is that with the change that people are seeing in attitudes as far as our federal government. You know, it starts there with the appointment of uh, two uh, Supreme Court justices who, whose track record has been shown that they are not sensitive to black needs. That signals a change. And people have taken that signal and think that now it's fashionable to show that they're racist, that show that uh, they have disregard for discrimination, to show disregard for laws that were developed in the 60s to alleviate these types of problems. Sam Jones, do you see that same problem? Well, <clears throat> I see, see the problem similarly and differently. First of all, let me just remind your viewing audience that <clears throat> there was, a, uh, there was a, a great black leader uh, many years ago, W.E.B. Du Bois, who reminded us that the problems of the 20th century would be the problems of the color line. My argument is that the problems of the 21st century will, will still be a problem of a color line. As, as Professor Rouse said earlier, 
uh, we are a, a, a nation of, of racism, and race has always made a difference as to what people like uh, this young man and I can and cannot do, Mr. Smith, uh, in American life, and it still makes a difference today. So race, for me, is the overriding factor in all of this. And, and as he said, if this had been, uh, maybe if this had been a black Puerto Rican, the same thing might have happened. But you see, that's what racism is all about. It's, it's an attitude uh, that uh, individuals and groups or institutions carry against other individuals and groups based purely upon race. So, so race is still a dominant factor as to what many of us can and cannot do in the society. And then you look at Gunnar Myrdal, whom we brought here many years ago from Sweden to analyze uh, race relations in America. And Gunnar Myrdal said, the problem we call a black problem is not, in fact, a black problem, but it's a white problem. And until whites change their attitudes toward Smith and me and the rest of us who are black, then we're always going to have a problem that we call a race problem. And then more recently, uh, I don't know if any of you have read his book, a fellow named Pinckney, Alfonso Pinckney, has just written a little book called The Myth About Black Progress. And while, yes, I grant that we've made strides, uh, Brother Smith and the rest of the panel, uh, there is still a myth about how much progress we have really made in this country as, uh, you know, as, uh, as a race, uh, in spite of the fact that, uh, that tremendous strides have been made uh, in this country by, by people like us. Yeah, I, I think we have to define racism first. That's a, sure. that's a very difficult term. Essentially, racism would be making decisions about other people based upon something other than what they are or the sure. characteristics that they have in terms of what they can do. But, 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 race is all, but race or color is always a factor in that definition of racism. Absolutely. Yeah, that, now, that's, now, that's the point. That's now, the in point. terms of our history, uh, the, the, the textbooks and the researchers tell us that, uh, uh, that there is little evidence that white, the, the white masses have been overly concerned about the plight of blacks. Also, we know in terms of the most progress in terms of racism, segregation, and that kind of thing in this country, uh, the, it has been the non-elected branch of government, the Supreme Court and the courts, and that's the reason for your focus upon the Supreme Court. So blacks have sought salvation, if that's the appropriate phrase, not from legislatures because the legislatures reflect popular elected white perceptions. Yeah, until, until that was true though, I think, until 1964 until we got the, the Voting Rights Act, and particularly as it relates to the South, where we began to see blacks, uh, as I grew up in the South, where before my daddy paid poll taxes, but lived and died at, at, at 72 and never voted. But since 64, given the opportunity to vote uh, with the Voting Rights Act and, and, and the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65, Voting Rights Act of 65, we have seen a, a tremendous change because I can remember when people got elected in the South by being able to yell nigga, nigga, nigga the loudest, but now that black people can go to the polls and vote in greater quantities, legislation is now making a difference in terms of the lives of black people. It's begun to make a difference more, uh, maybe more, more often now up, up South than maybe down South, where obviously there have been great strides made uh, legislatively because of the influx of elected officials. Uh, at state legislative levels primarily, but not exclusively so. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. since this is an Indiana program and we're trying to parlay the whole focus upon race that was raised in New York State upon Indiana, how is racism similar as far as the rest of the country is concerned, and how is it different perhaps here in Muncie or in Indianapolis or in Indiana? Let me tell you, I run, a, run an agency in Indianapolis called the Indianapolis Urban League. There's six other agencies similarly situated in some major cities in, in the state of Indiana. My staff gave me a report in uh, December that indicated that from September through uh, the board meeting in December, we had had 52 cases of discrimination that had just literally walked through our doors in housing, and in employment. And, and until recent times, we have not seen nearly as many overt cases of out and out uh, discrimination against blacks in, in housing and in, uh, in employment. And as Mr. Smith said earlier, 
there just appears to be a climate on the horizon now nationally that has an impact locally that says to people, it's all right now to discriminate against people who are black because, uh, you know, not much, very much is going to happen. There's a push now to eliminate affirmative action and there's not much interest anymore in, uh, in uh, race relations and improving upon the quality of race relations that locally and nationally. So, so it's fashionable to, to discriminate again. And it's unfortunate that we are seeing a reversal in what many people thought was uh, a pathway of progress. And, and I think Pinckney's right. The, 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 there's a whole myth about black progress, whether you're talking about Muncie, Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, my hometown, our dear, dearly beloved state of Indiana. There is now a return to the notion that it's fashionable to discriminate against people of color. Some people blame yeah. the attitude of the Reagan administration toward race relations. Is, do you see it that yeah, way? I, there, there, is a, there is a great uh, 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 tendency to attribute some of this to the Reagan administration, particularly because that administration argues that we are living in, quote unquote, a colorblind society. And, and uh, I don't know where they get that, uh, their information from, but that's far from the truth. But that's not the only reason. It, the fact is that we have never really solved the problem that we call a race problem. And you mentioned it earlier, that the masses have never really been overly concerned. And that's true again, whether we're talking about the crossroads of America, or middle America, or mid-America, mid, mid which is in part uh, Muncie, Indiana as the model, or, or, or Peoria, Illinois is the other model with all of the rest of us in between. Uh, no, we haven't solved that problem. Uh, Irvin, I, I saw you nodding there. What yeah. did you do? Well, there's several things that kind of struck my fancy when what Sam was saying. Here in Muncie, uh, as president of the NAACP here, I, I received quite a few complaints concerning discrimination and racism. And I agree with what Sam has said and that our records have shown that, that has, there has been an increase number of complaints of discrimination, both in employment and in housing. Uh, we're seeing it not in the areas that we never saw it before and that we're seeing a lot of uh, complaints concerning uh, uh, participation in, in government. Uh, that black voters are now getting a lot smarter about who they're going to vote for. They're looking at candidates who are going to be more sensitive to their needs. And what's happening as an outgrowth of that, with the way the political structure is set up here in Muncie and in Delaware County, is that a lot of blacks now are looking at candidates and saying, well, I got you in office, but I don't see the reciprocal effect in that you're helping me in my situation in my community. Our number one problem in the black community in Muncie right now happens to be unemployment, which is a major problem throughout this nation. Now, we hear glaring reports about how the economy is progressing, but if you look around and you look in the black community, a lot of those people miss that trickle-down effect that Mr. Reagan described. This, and that has led to tensions. Uh, when there's unemployment, there's going to be problems with people not having the things that they see others with. You know, a discrimination is going to be with us forever because people discriminate as a matter of human values. For example, my values might not be the same as someone else's values, and their values perhaps predominate for that particular time. But the issue here is that is the issue of not just discrimination, because we all feel that from time to time. The issue is race discrimination, and that's the key issue. But, but it's also, Professor Ross, it's discrimination which, uh, again, and you're in public policy, it's discrimination which, which then denies me, from a public policy point of view, equal access to opportunity. And that's where the, pro where the difference lies yeah, between absolutely. Uh, discrimination based upon, uh, upon ideology values or upon values or, 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 politics, or politics or, politics or, 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 any, of those, or any of those things. So if yeah. you deny me because I'm black or because I'm right. Hispanic or because I'm Mexican-American or because I'm female or whatever, you know, then that's, that's where the problem lies. And that's the big difference mm -hmm. in, in looking at discrimination uh, as we, we talk about it here this morning on, on, or today on the program. Yeah, you know, in, in terms of the research, uh, they, they claim that the greatest implementation in the last 20 years has been in voting and school desegregation. Moderate implementation has come in employment and bilingual education. The least implementation involving civil rights has come in higher education, housing, and what is called second generation 
discrimination. And that sort of picks up on Irving's point. In other words, as, rights, as blacks got the, the political rights to vote, it's one thing to get the politics. It's something else. The economics in terms of that development is a much longer range and, and also insidious process in terms of discrimination. Uh, so, so the thing in terms of frustration, as Irving was saying, there are blacks who are, who are becoming educated. The question is, can they move up in the various kind of economic areas? Well, see, that's a major problem that we have. We were, it, when I grew up in the 60s, in which my teachers told me that unless you got a college degree, you wouldn't be able to compete in, to wor in the world today. Well, that's been about 15, 16 years ago. Now, I'm sitting here with a college education, but yet I find my path for upward mobility constrained because there are others competing with me. Although I may have the same, I've got the same type of training, we're still not seeing the avenues open the way that, they, that we thought they, or perceived that they were going to to uh, go, but we, what I'm trying to say is that although opportunities are available, unless you possess a skill and are, in, and, and are able to market it in a place that's going to give you an opportunity to, to uh, you know, use your abilities to the fullest extent, we're, we're no better off. Uh, students are feeling frustrated because they knock on their door with college degrees, but yet they get in into entry-level positions and they remain there for years on top of years. Is enforcement of civil rights laws, uh, is that purely the domain of government? I mean, let's look at the urban league, let's look at the NAACP. I think it, the NAACP is perceived as a lobby, a special interest group for black interests that further accentuates the color line. Whereas, in fact, you're dealing with matters that the Justice Department on a federal level, local civil rights commissions on a local level, uh, ought to be looking at. Uh, where does the NAACP and the Urban League fit into this? Well, you just answered the question that you just asked in that if those organizations were enforcing those policies to the letter of the law, there would be no need for an NAACP or an Urban League. That is the problem. We have statutes on the books, but they're not being enforced. Now. There are a lot of ways to get around the statutes in that, you know, uh, there's been a lot of arguing about goals and timetables. Well, a lot, in a lot of instances, a company will, yes, will meet that goal and no more. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think he's basically right, but I would probably have to argue that even with uh, the federal, state, and local efforts, you would still need organizations like the NAACP and Urban League. I'm not sure that we're ready yet for them to sunset uh, in spite of all that we have uh, legislatively and also the volunteer efforts on the part of many, many corporations. Uh, there, there are just some folk who, in spite of, uh, in spite of governmental uh, regulations, who are going to try to find ways to circumvent. But one of the things I suppose that, that legislation has done, and we talked about it off the air earlier, is that it's, it's been a a, a regulator of human behavior in terms of, of uh, providing an opportunity for us to have access to, uh, to the doors. The problem has been, as Mr. Smith said, we've had access or limited access or relatively limited access to, to the doors of opportunity, but once we've got in, we haven't moved up the ladder uh, as rapidly as, as many of us think we should. And you look around, uh, I'm sure Muncie or Indianapolis or most of our major Indiana cities, and we will find that blacks, in spite of our progress in education and in and, and various areas, are still not found in junior, middle, and upper level management. Uh, there are very few of us on corporate boards, in spite of the fact that we could all probably make lists of people who could serve admirably on corporate boards of major corporations in Muncie or in Indianapolis or in Fort Wayne or wherever. Uh, the problem is that is that if you leave if you leave efforts of human and social change to volunteerism they're not going to occur we saw that in the south with public with desegregation efforts in the schools when everyone was saying leave it to volunteerism let it and it'll happen uh, it, it's not going to happen there's got to be some some nudging some catalyst to encourage uh, an approach toward human and social change and that's why we're still going to be necessary for a long time yet so, uh, 
Sam, uh, Indiana, of course, is a Republican state uh, for the most part for the last 10 years. It is also a business-oriented state. Sure. Is this culture, is it any different in, a, in, in dealing with racism here in Indiana than, say, it might be in Ohio or Illinois or something like that? No, I, I would think that, the, that the, all of those states uh, that you named are pretty much the same. We're basically, we basically have been heavy industrial states that are, that are rapidly on the down skids now in terms of heavy industry, wherein in the early years we could lure people from high school, even before they completed high school, into the factories to work. You make good salaries and with, with very little training and, uh, and live ha happily thereafter as middle class. Now we're saying the answer is high tech, and those, many of those folks that we lured into the, the heavy industries do not now have skills that are transferable to the so-called high tech economy and, and they're virtually out, That's which is part of our problem. And the other part of it is that, well, uh, Indiana, I'm not so sure that Indiana is a heavily Republican state, because once upon a time, we were able to have a bipartisan uh, representation in the Congress. Uh, I think we are probably, we may even be even, but it probably is a case that Democrats don't uh, go to the polls and vote or don't take their politics as seriously as Republicans tend to take their politics. Um, and so, as a result, uh, Republicans tend to uh, tend to uh, to uh, to win more often and to ha maintain control longer than perhaps Democrats in the state of Indiana. Uh, so I, I don't see us being any different uh, in, from Ohio. Or, I think you know we are. There's another similarity, and that is that we're basically all rural. The legislatures are basically dominated by rural legislators whose interests are less urban than they are rural, and you get the rural-urban hassle over uh, slices of the, uh, the state's uh, f uh, fiscal pie, if you will, uh, obviously which uh, boils down to who, can, uh, who can, uh, can, can, can gain the most in terms of the political uh, muscle in the legislature, and generally that's, that has been uh, Republican until uh, maybe uh, some recent times. Well, isn't political uh, muscle what's going to have to make the difference, which is going to turn the corner? At some point, I mean, blacks are going to have to stop, as they did in, in 84, stop supporting in large numbers Ronald Reagan. Well, let me tell you what I think is going to have to happen. I think there, there has to be, obviously, there has to be political muscle, and blacks have to still continue to be a part of the political process. And as Mr. Smith said earlier on, we've got to look at the candidates without regard to party, as far as I'm concerned, who's going to, going to mean most to the black community. I think, again, we have to keep the focus on economics. I think it's very important for us to strengthen the economic uh, dimensions of the black community, because money talks any way we slice it. Uh, thirdly, I think that we have to keep the thrust on education. It's very important that we keep the thrust toward education. Education is a valuable commodity. Uh, in, in Muncie, in Indianapolis, in the state of Indiana, and in, in the United States, and indeed the world. And then I think, uh, fifthly, we've got to keep the thrust on race relations, because we have not yet reached the point where uh, we live in a society that is colorblind. Uh, color still makes a difference, in my view, as to what can and cannot be done uh, in, in this society. And then I think we have to also keep a thrust on, on what I call what you call human values and what I call uh, moral and ethical values. I think, you know, religion is still a very important ingredient in terms of community life in Muncie and in Indianapolis and in the state of Indiana and in the nation. And if we can keep those six thrusts in front of us, it seems to me that uh, while we won't uh, reach the millennium, we will at least move more definitively toward what I want to see as more constructive human and social change in Muncie and in Indianapolis and, and, uh, and across the state of Indiana. Well, but what aren't you saying that what you really need are people in positions of leadership, whether it's the governor, the legislature, the presidency, the Congress, the Supreme Court, who are going to make civil rights, make race relations a priority? Well, my point is that, that my white brothers and sisters have to take the disproportionate responsibility in this, wherever they are, whether it's the governor, or the mayor, or the state legislators, uh, the congressional leadership from Indiana, corporate leadership, and then the rest of us have to follow. I think but, that's but, the charge. But Sam, challenge. it seems to be a historical fact, and that's a pretty heavy statement, I guess, that those who seek power 
or you have to take power. And unless the Jesse Jacksons, and I don't mean to focus on one personality especially, but unless they raise the issues of affirmative action, and basically we all agree about equal, equal opportunity, the controversy comes with affirmative action in terms of how it's carried out. Well, it comes from more than that. I guess it was Fred Douglas who said on one occasion, power concedes nothing without a demand. Right. And if we sit back and, and, and refuse to make demands upon the society, upon the system, then not very much is going to happen for us. And that's why we are still very necessary, well, we, the NAACP and the Urban League. It, it seems to me that the policy towards race in this area is one of benign neglect. Yes. In other words, if you're raised in the South and you're white, you know about blacks. Mm -hmm. But if you're raised in Indiana, you have very little contact with blacks. Well, I'd like to, answer, I'd like to address that. I've lived in both the South and the North. In the South, as a black person, you know exactly where you stand in, in regards to, to race. In the North, it's different in that I call it uh, toleration. There's some type of legislation that's been mandated that you hire X number of people. You, you basically, it's a subtle type of discrimination, a, a subtle type of racism in which you accept it because the, the government says that I need X number of you to be here. Other than that, yeah. uh, but it had to be like a little bit pregnant. I mean, you're either pregnant or you're not. You're either racist or you're not. I mean, there are no, really no degrees in. in oh in yes, that. there is. There is. You you see that here in Indiana. Okay, we're out of time today. I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks to our panelists, Sam Jones from the Urban League in Indianapolis, Irving Smith from the NAACP here in Muncie, and John Rouse, our producer. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for joining us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Rouse, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Rouse. Associate producers are Cecil Bohannon and Bill Mosier. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.